Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Today I'm going to be giving my thoughts on the Eberron Rising from the Last War campaign setting book. Uh, so this is really only the second dedicated campaign setting that has been released for uh, the Dungeons and Dragons game. Um, you could argue the third if you wanted to look at um, Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, but that still feels very regional. Um, this year though, um, I'm really really impressed with what I've read through it uh, so far. So we're gonna do just a very, very cursory flip through. Um, I do plan on doing more uh, focused flip throughs of the different chapters as a series of later videos, but this is a 300 page book. I'm not gonna flip through every single page uh, in this book in one video, because I think we'd be here for quite a while. Uh, so just looking at the back here, uh, so we just have the, uh, the information. So it says, Banish the Shadows of War. <clears throat> uh, whether aboard an airship or train car, embark on thrilling adventures shrouded in intrigue. <clears throat> Discover secrets buried by years of devastating war in magic field weapons. Uh, in, oh, sorry, in which magic field weapons threaten an entire continent. In the post-war world, magic pervades everyday uh, life, and people of all sorts flock to Sharn, a city of wonders where skyscrapers pierce the clouds. Uh, will you find your fortune on mean city streets or scouring haunted battlefields? Will you throw in your lot with the mighty dine or the mighty dragon marked houses? Will you seek truth as a newspaper reporter, uh, a university researcher, or a government spy? Or will you forge a destiny that defies the scars of war? Uh, this book provides tools that both players and dungeon masters need to explore the world of Eberron, including the artificer class, a master of magical invention, and monsters birthed uh, by ancient warmongering forces. Will Ebron enter a prosperous new age, or will the shadow of war descend once again? Uh, the retail price for this is $49.95 US and $65.95 Canadian. Uh, now, this book was sent to me by Wizards of the Coast for the purposes of doing uh, a review. However, Wizards of the Coast is not mandating anything that I say. They're not looking for, um, the, they're not requesting the video ahead of time to remove or take out parts that they may not necessarily like. They, you know, sent it to me and everything that I'm going to say here in this video is my own genuine personal thoughts. So without further ado, let's just sort of dive into it. Like I said, I'm not going to flip through everything. I'm just going to sort of hit certain uh, parts that I want to really talk about uh, for the purposes of this video. The first chapter, chapter one, is all about character creation and it's pretty long. Um, it starts on page uh, 17, I think. Yeah, it starts on page 17 and ends on page 101. So there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff in here uh, to sort of digest. Uh, <clears throat> so we have the races. Um, so these are, all the races from the player's handbook are mentioned in here as a way of sort of fitting them into the Eberron campaign setting. Uh, we also have new races uh, that are, have been added into here, such as the changelings, which have the ability to alter their appearance similar to a doppelganger. Goblinoids, so the bugbears, goblins, and hobgoblins. The Kalashtar, which are humanoids that are bound um, to spirits from the plane of dreams. Um, they're sort of, they're, they're the antithesis, I guess, to another uh, race that has very similar uh, background. Um, then we have orcs uh, available in here as well, just full-blooded orcs as well as half-orcs. Then you have shifters, which sound similar to the changelings, but shifters have, um, they're, they're kind of like, in the past, they they were described as having lycanthrop like blood, um, like one sixteenth or something like that. But basically, they can shift their form into a more bestial appearance, and then they gain abilities based off of what that bestial appearance uh, sort of changes about their physical form. And then we have the Warforged. Um, so uh, the Warforged are the race that I really want to talk about <clears throat> the most in this section. I will say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm still recovering from a bit of a cold. I will say that the the changelings, the Kalashtar, and the shifters are all really, really well done, and they've got some awesome stuff. And when I do the flip through of this section <clears throat> in more detail, I will um, I'll, I'll talk about them more there. <clears throat> the Warforged, like I said, are the main ones that I want to talk about in this particular video because I feel that <clears throat> the Warforged don't live up to their potential. 
um, when the Eberron setting was sort of first announced, um, when they were doing the, the Wayfinders Guide and the playtest stuff, Wizards of the Coast released a Unearthed Arcana article which had the Warforged race in there as a playable race, and they even went so far as to make it legal for D&D Adventures League. Uh, the Warforged there had three different sub-races. There was the Juggernaut, which was sort of the heavy. They had like a fist attack, a slam attack that they could use. Their strength was, was beefed up, and uh, they were sort of like the, they were the, like the frontline infantry type of like battlefield fighting warforged that were created. Uh, then you had the envoys, which were sort of more skill based, <clears throat> and they had like, um, you could actually have like a tool, um, like thieves tools or any sort of like any of those types of tool sets from the player's handbook could actually be integrated into their body. And then you had the Warforged Scout, which was sort of a more mobile uh, type of uh, Warforged. Uh, they were fine in of themselves, but one ability that the Warforged had, which I think was what led to them being pulled from uh, Adventures League legality after a very short period of time, I think it was only a week, maybe two, that they were legal before they were pulled, was they had this ability called Integrated Protection, or they had the ability to customize their armor, um, armor configuration. And they could choose to change it every single day, which, okay, it's fine. You may want sections where you have lighter armor if you're worried about stealth being an issue. Um, or if you're going to, you know, you know you're going to fight, you know, some sort of deadly foe, you might want heavier armor. That I kind of understand, although it was never an ability of the Warforged before. Um, so it just didn't sit well with me at that point, just on that purpose. <clears throat> but it's something I wouldn't outright ban or change. The one thing that I definitely would change was the fact that they were allowed to add their proficiency bonuses to the different armor configurations. Uh, the, the, so the heaviest uh, configuration gave them like, it was 16 armor class, plus their proficiency bonus, um, plus they could use like shields and stuff like that. Um, then you had, the, the next one down I think was 14, and that one you could add your full dex modifier and your proficiency bonus, so a higher level character um, could potentially be adding plus 11 uh, without having any sort of like magical enhancements or anything. Um, so you can get up to a 25 armor class um, at higher levels, which was something that Adventurers League sort of tended to gravitate towards. People wanted to play the higher levels more than the lower ones. Um, so the, the armor could basically just get out of hand. And it wasn't one of those things where you had to decide at character creation, you could change on a whim, which I don't think worked really well. So there were definitely some feedback and some issues with the Warforged not being very well balanced. And I think Wizards took that information and then ran 50 yards too far in the other direction. Uh, so now the sub races are all gone, which I really don't like because I thought that the sub races made perfect sense. Um, I actually made a house ruled version of the Warforged race, which I'm going to be honest, <clears throat> when I run an Eberron campaign, which I, I am hoping to do with my next 5th edition game, I am going to be taking this Warforged out and substituting in the Warforged uh, that I house ruled because I think that that one just works a little bit better. Um, and just feels like you get you get more you know options without it breaking uh, the game. So for example, uh, the sub race that I chose for my house rules dictates what your armor class is, <clears throat> and there's no proficiency bonus added to it. So like the Warforged Scout had a base armor class of 11, so it's as if they were wearing leather armor, uh, but they could add their Dex modifier. Then the Envoy had 13 base armor class plus their con or plus their Dex modifier. And then you had the, the Juggernaut, which had a 15 plus um, their dex modifier up to a maximum of plus 2. So they were sort of like a medium armor. And then I had downtime activities that the Warforged could use to um, increase their armor. Like they could reinforce their armor, giving it a plus 1 bonus. Or they could actually remove the armor plating so that they could wear regular suits of armor. Because Warforged in the past were never able to wear regular suits of armor, and that's something that's just sort of changed in this version of the game. So with this one, the Warforged gets plus two to con and plus one to an ability score of your choice. So that gives you a little bit of customization there. One thing I will say that I do like about this book, um, for all the races that they've added, 
is it actually lets you randomly determine your starting height and weight <clears throat> based off of like rolling extra dice and having that as a modifier that you add or multiply. It's just awesome, awesome stuff. And it really reminds me of like advanced Dungeons and Dragons where you did that. So that's one thing that the races, I think it's just really, really cool touch for me. Uh, and I'm sure for other people that are, have started with AD and D, it'll be nice to see something like that come back into the default version of the character. Uh, your speed is 30, you have constructive resilience, so you have advantage on saving throws against poison, you have a resistance to the poison damage, <clears throat> you don't need to eat, drink, or breathe, um, you're immune to disease, you don't need to sleep, and magic can't put you to sleep. However, you do have to enter a six hour period of inactivity, um, which is called Sentry's Rest. Uh, you can still see in here as normal, so it's not quite the same as like an elven trance or regular sleep, but you can't be doing anything other than being able to observe what's going on around you. And then we get into the integrated uh, protection here. So this is the, the thing that they changed the most. So now you just get a plus one bonus armor class. This plus one bonus does stack with any type of armor, but now they can wear armor. And that just never felt like a Warforged ability. In fact, they, again, they used to have to remove their built-in armor plating to wear armor in the past. Now what happens is they put a suit of armor on, it gets incorporated into their body so that you know, it takes an hour to do, it takes an hour to remove, but the only person that can remove the armor is the Warforged. I don't really like that ability, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I think there were better ways to, to do that, um, to have like the, the Warforged armor stuff um, without it. Because again, they just never were wearing armor in the past unless they removed their regular plating. So not too keen on that. Uh, then they have specialized design, which gives them uh, skill proficiency, and one tool proficiency of their choice, and then their languages. So, of the races that are in this book, I think they did a fantastic job with all of them. The Warforged, while it's not necessarily what I would consider to be a bad race, I just think it's too far removed from what they were initially trying to do that I don't. I, I wouldn't use this version. Uh, now, my house ruled version, I do have available on my Facebook page. There's It's just in the notes section. Uh, I might actually pin it um, as a as a pinned uh, post at this point, just so people can check it out if they want to. But that's the version that I think I would go with. Even if I removed the downtime activities for modifying their bodies, I think I would still use the base versions of the, the host ruled ones over this one. Uh, next thing that I want to touch on really quick is the dragon marked houses. When I started, or when I first picked this up, I had no idea how they were going to incorporate the dragon marks and how they were going to grant their abilities, because in the past, Dragon Marks were granted through feats, and feats were way easier to come by and more plentiful than they are in 5th edition. So what they actually ended up doing is, depending on your race, and the, the Dragon Marked houses are based off of your actual race. So it's not something that you can choose whichever one you want. You have to be the, the corresponding race to have the Dragon Marked ability. But what they did is they actually made it either a variant version of the race for like humans and half orcs, so it completely replaces all of the abilities that they would have gotten through the player's handbook and gives them a whole new set of abilities. Uh, for half elves, it's kind of a mix, uh, so it replaces some features, but they keep others. And then for dwarves, elves, uh, gnomes, and halflings, it actually replaces the sub race. So instead of being a um, a wood elf, you're an elf with the you know with the mark of shadow so you're you're an elf from house uh, Thrani instead of being a wood elf uh, sort of thing um, <clears throat> you know so they they do that for all of the, the the all of those races so dwarves elves gnomes and halflings they still get the base stuff in the player's handbook but then the sub race is replaced with the dragon mark house which i think was actually a really cool idea <clears throat> uh, each dragon mark grants you some innate abilities and it also adds some ability or some spells to a spell list that you would have if you have spell casting ability. So if you're an artificer, uh, you know, bard, any any spell casting class, um, if you have a dragon mark, you can add these spells to your list to choose from, either to choose as like spontaneous spells if you're a spontaneous spellcaster, or that you can add to your spell book, or that you can add to your list if you're a divine caster. Uh, these aren't automatically granted in terms of being automatically prepared and not counting against your daily preparations. They're just spells that are added uh, for you to potentially be able to use, even if your spellcasting class normally wouldn't allow that. 
Uh, so we've got a great big section there, and then we have the Artificer class, which, interestingly enough, doesn't have any brand new spells in this book. Um, its entire spell list is derived from the Player's Handbook, as well as the Xanathar's Guide to everything. So I feel that that's a bit of a weakness uh, for the class here, because it requires you to have Xanathar's Guide to get the full range of spells for your class. And I think they would have been better served, even just taking a little bit of time to reprint those in this book, even if it might be redundant, just because not everyone is going to have all those supplements, right? So I, I think that that's something that probably should have been done a little bit differently, but the class itself does seem pretty cool. Uh, they get uh, the ability to create things, tinker with things. Um, you have these artificial, artificer infusions that you can either grant like abilities to existing items or you can flat out create items. So if you do the replicate magic item infusion, uh, then you can actually, whenever you take it, you choose one from a list that is available to you and you can just create that item. So at, at second level, you decide that I wanna take the replicate magic items ability. Um, you could have it so that you can create like sending stones or wand of secrets or something like that, uh, which is pretty cool. With the infusions, also, if any of the abil uh, items that you create uh, require attunement, uh, once you create the item, you can automatically attune to it. But you have to choose right then and there, otherwise you have to spend the hour like anyone else would. So, uh, just pretty cool stuff there. Uh, then you also have a patron section. Uh, which is sort of like a, uh, like, it's basically like a group background that uh, allows you to, it just, it gives you someone that can help sort of guide uh, the story. So there's all kinds of cool different uh, abilities in here as well, which I'll go into in more detail, like I said, when I do the flip throughs of the individual chapters, because like I said, there's just a lot of stuff uh, to sort of take in. So once we get past the character creation section, which goes all the way to page 101, uh, we finally get into the Gazetteer. So this is your actual campaign setting information. And this is really, really uh, well done as well. First thing, uh, if you're familiar with Eberron, you will know what the Mornland is. If you're not familiar, uh, just very, very briefly, uh, during the last war, uh, which pitted five nations against one another um, for the right to, to determine which one of their those nations' leaders was going to become the ruler of the entire continent, um, there, one of the nations was named Seer. And the day of mourning was the day that the nation of Seer suffered a massive cataclysmic event that no one knows what it is. And I'll touch on that a little bit more later on as well. But the borders of the, the country actually are um, veiled in this mist, this fog here, which fills like the, the, the border and wraps around the entire, uh, what, would, what once was uh, Seer and is now known as the Mornland. And this is a really fantastic uh, artwork. Like if you look, you see like faces, skulls, it's just really disturbing uh, imagery. And it really creates the sense that you don't want to go in there. So I think that that's really well done. Uh, for everything else, for the nations, we have our map here with all of our political boundaries. And it gives you a decent amount of information. So it gives you things like major cities, locations, how the last war affected it, and some information along those lines. It's capital, what they're known for, some interesting notes about them, some um, just notes about, you know, what types of characters you might see there. Uh, so it gives you, again, a decent amount of information for you to be able to create your own stuff out of, but it doesn't lock you in. And that's something that uh, I've been noticing a lot lately about some of the newer campaign settings, is that they leave things vague enough for individual DMs or game masters to put their own uh, spin on. And uh, they do that here very well as well. So. Again, it's something that it gives you just enough that you can flavor things, but not enough that it holds your hand and lets you create the, you know, the individuals or the locations that you really want to create and just using that little bit of flavoring. So uh, some great stuff there. So that goes through all the, the locations within the, the main continent of, uh, of Corvair, as well as a little bit of information on places like Zendrik, Arganassan, and Sarlona, which are other continents that have their own sort of uh, stories. Arganassan is dominated by dragons. Sarlona has the Inspired, which are those vessels that are controlled by spirits from the, the realm of dreams or nightmares. 
Uh, and then you have Zendrick, which used to be dominated by uh, giants, but something happened centuries or millennia ago that led to the eventual decline uh, and de-evolution of the giant race. Uh, you also have things like Kyber, which is the sort of like the Underdark uh, version of Eberron. And there's some cool stuff in there as well uh, with Kyber. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it just yet. Uh, because again, I can talk about it a little bit more, but it has your basic underdark that you'd expect with the tunnels and caverns. But if you go deeper, there's like these almost like demi planes of existence that connect regions of the world in ways that don't make geographical sense. Um, just really, really cool stuff. Uh, and then we get into our deities as well. You have to have that information, um, which the deities in Eberron are the people can actually question their existence because they don't involve them themselves the way that other gods do in a uh, place like Forgotten Realms or, or Dragon, or not Dragon, I mean, well, Dragonlands, I guess, to an extent, too. Uh, Greyhawk, all that stuff. Um, so the, the, they have all the information, the basic information that you would need there. Um, the main religions would be things like the Sovereign Host, which is actually a um, made up of several different gods that you might worship or pray to for different things. So, again, just a lot of great information there. And then we get into chapter three, which is all about Sharn, the city of towers. This is your major central, I don't want to say central hub, but this is your biggest city in the, the world of Eberron. This is the similar, like this fills the same kind of role as places like Waterdeep in the Forgotten Realms or the city of Greyhawk in the Greyhawk setting. So this is like, again, your, your major city. And this city is, it's called the city of towers. It's, um, the elemental plane of air kind of crosses over a little bit into this section of the world. So it allows you to build like these massive towers without having to worry so much about the effects of gravity and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> there's actually also a section of the city that's literally built on top of clouds, which is the wealthiest of the wealthy. But if you go down deeper, it's built on like the ruins of the ancient goblin empire. And it is fully possible to create an entire campaign that never leaves the city of Sharn. There's just, like, there's so much to potentially do in there. Uh, here's just sort of our basic map. Uh, the cogs is sort of like what's built on the ruins of, like, the ancient uh, uh, goblinoid uh, civilization. Um, and you get, again, a very decent amount of information in here as well. So, the uh, just for these purposes, the chapter starts on page 151 and goes to page 181. So you get 30 pages of write-up just on the city of Sharn itself. Then we have my favorite chapter here, which is the Building Eberron Adventures. Again, I'm not going to focus too much on this right now, but it gives you a bunch of information and a bunch of ideas that you can use to build adventures on. Um, so, for example, I kind of want to build my next campaign on the Cult of the Dragon Below, which is actually a series of cults that follow different, like, aberrant creatures, like Mind Flayers, Beholders, stuff like that. Um, and so it gives you information on the, like, so you can randomly determine or you can just use these charts uh, to figure out what cult you want to use. So, for example, one of these here uh, says a cult of uh, Darren, which is one of the, um, one of the, the arch creatures that created things like the Mind Flayers and stuff. Uh, so, led by a Mind Flayer, kidnaps people with dragon marks, seeking to decipher the marks and transfer them to others. So, that could be a cool concept for an adventure. So, the, the players, for example, um, start noticing that members of dragon marked houses are being abducted and no one knows what's happening to them. Uh, this would be a really great adventure to use if one of the characters has a dragon marked and people come after them sort, sort of idea. So, just ideas that you can use for stuff there. Uh, it gives you NPCs as well, um, like just some information you can use to create NPCs. So, for example, you might have a respected noble that behaves more erratically as time goes on, treating their servants and family with uh, random and escalating cruelty because their mind's being warped by um, their exposure to the cult kind of idea. And then you have different plot hooks that you can use. So just a lot of awesome stuff uh, to create adventures on just based off of like, you know, and there's a ton of these in here as well. So a lot of really, really great ideas. So even if you're not super familiar with the world and this is your first exposure to it, it gives you some stuff to work with and some really 
amazing plot hooks in, in, in my opinion. So this is like, so this is, this would be my favorite chapter. It also talks about the manifest zones. I mentioned the air of, uh, the main, the air of the, the plane of air, um, sort of, uh, manifesting in Eberron or, uh, in Sharn. So that's just sort of how that works. And it goes over different information for how the different zones. So the, the, the planes, as we know them from other settings don't exist in this world, but creatures still sort of can. It's just, they have their own sort of spin and flavor to them and they interact differently with, uh, the, the world of Eberron than they would with stuff like, um, Greyhawk and Dragonlance, things like that. So then we just have, again, that's also a very, very lengthy chapter. And then we have different treasures, so magic items like replacement limbs uh, for veterans of the lost war, or the last war, um, you know, modifications to Warforged, stuff like that are in there as well. So some great stuff. And then we get into our little bestiary here with um, you know unique creatures, including some campaign enders. So we have some of the uh, the spawn of Dale Kerr, um, which we have like. So, for example, we have uh, Belishara, and she is known as the Lord of Eyes. And so she actually created, in this world, she created Beholders to serve as sort of like an artillery uh, for her forces. So just awesome stuff there. Really, really cool. And let me just have some of the more, you know, mundane creatures. But there's a lot of great stuff in here. We also have the Lord of Blades, if I can find him. He should be the next one, I think. Or amongst them. Oh, we also have the living spells. Uh, someone had actually asked me about these. Uh, there is information on how to create them yourself, um, but it gives you three ones to use as sort of a base uh, to go off of, and you just sort of modify these ones based off of like the level of spell and stuff. Um, so it, they sort of like so if you cast a spell, especially in the Mornland, if you cast a spell, there's a chance that it can actually become this living thing. Um, it used to be an ooze back in the day, but now they're, they're considered a construct. Uh, but basically they have like their own semi-intelligence. Um, they're more like animalistic sort of thing, but they can attack um, whoever created them or just continue to, to, to move on and do whatever they want. So that's, I, I always thought that was kind of cool. I actually have a living flaming sphere miniature that I use for the flaming sphere spell, if anyone has it. So uh, it's cool stuff there, but it does give you the ability to create them yourself, which is great. Uh, then we have things like the Lord of Blades, which is awesome to see in here, and he's challenge rating 18, which I think is the highest level he's ever been at. Um, so in the past, he was considered sort of a mid-level opponent. Um, in the original Eberron setting, I think he was level 12. Um, in 4th edition, he was he was higher, but in 4th edition, it also went to level 30 instead. So he was still sort of in that mid-tier, but this is someone now that you could actually build uh, a campaign around. And I've always loved the, the Lord of Blades. I always thought he was a great uh, villain there. And uh, we have some of the overlords that the Lords of Dust are trying to free. And these things, if they get free, it could be very, very devastating. They're sort of uh, similar to like the Arch Devils or Demon Lords. Uh, but like this one here, for example, uh, Rakt uh, Tolkesh is challenge level 28. So that's pretty, pretty dang powerful um, overall. So there we have it. Uh, we also have, oh, uh, so that's it for there. There is an adventure included in there as well. I think that was in uh, chapter four. Uh, and then we have our map at the back here. I will tear this out and show this in a separate video, um, but that's what we have contained within the book itself. So overall, my thoughts of the Eberron is Rising from the Last War campaign setting book is I think that this is a fantastic campaign setting. Of the campaign books that have come out so far, which would be um, things like the Sword Coast Adventures Guide, the Ravnica setting, I think that this is hands down the best one. And this is really the one that should have come out a year ago um, and should have been, you know, it, this should have been the first one that they released, in my opinion. But it's out now. And I'm happy about that. Uh, one thing about the Eberron setting that I've seen people complain about um, that I don't think is necessarily true, although the marketing and the, the, the write-up sort of makes it feel like it's true, is there are people that say that they don't want to run a campaign in this like gritty pulp noir type of style. 
Um, they just want something that's more of a standard Dungeons and Dragons type of campaign. And the thing about Eberron that doesn't really get discussed enough is the fact that you can run any style of game that you want. This setting uh, conforms to that. Like you can actually run any type of game that you want. If you want the gritty sort of like noir stuff with the intrigue and like the political plots or the dragon marked houses and their you know influence or you know the things that they're doing you can run that type of game if you want to run a conspiracy theory type of adventure or a campaign revolving around the cults of the dragon below and who might be a member and who might not be you can and have the players sort of try to uh, unearth you know information and expose the cult you can do that if you want to have like a tomb raiding style game where the characters go to the continent of Zendrick uh, you know fight their way through the jungles um, and then find like these strange abandoned ruins and explore them you can do that um, you could have just a standard dungeon crawling uh, type of experience uh, as well if that's the kind of thing that you want to do so any type of game that you want to run uh, makes sense for for it to exist in that world. So I, you know, I know that Wizards kind of likes the idea of it being this like you know noir type of thing, but you don't have to adhere to that. You know, if you don't want to, you can run any type of game that you want in there. So I think that's an important thing uh, to note. Another great thing about this book is it leaves a lot of major things open ended, so that you can create your own explanations and you can create your own stories around that. So, for example, things like the Day of Mourning, things like what the Draconic Prophecy um, is leading to, um, stuff like that is never going to be properly explained, or at least it never should be, um, because that's the kind of stuff that, you know, it, DMs can build entire campaigns around. So it gives you a little bit of information, but nothing that ever is concrete or will define what those things are. So you can do anything that you want with the Day of Mourning. Whatever caused that destruction of the, of the nation of Seer can be whatever you want it to be. Um, in one campaign I was running, it was um, basically an attempt to resurrect a giant or a titan um, that was like this titan of death. And a, uh, a whole pantheon of gods um, dedicated themselves to protecting the world from this death titan's abilities. So when they tried to summon or tried to resurrect him, uh, the, the, the gods interfered and they created the, the cataclysm that destroyed Seer. So that was one of my explanations for it, but it could be anything that you want it to be. It could be a magical experiment gone wrong. It could be the use of a potent, uh, the testing of like a potent magical weapon. Um, sort of like the equivalent of a fantasy atomic bomb. It could be anything that you want it to be, and it will never be fully defined, so you can put whatever spin on it that you want. So that's the thing about Eberron, is that it is very customizable to any type of game style, any type of adventure that you want to run, and I don't think that aspect of it really gets played up enough. So if you don't want it to be, you know, like I said, the gritty um, in political intrigue style game, you don't have to have it be that way. So that's one thing that I really wanted to make clear here. Uh, as well. So this is, like I said, a fantastic book. It gives you a lot of solid foundation uh, to work off of. It gives you lots of fantastic adventure ideas that you can use. It gives you a lot of great villains that you can use right off the bat through this book, including some that are definitely campaign enders. So if one of those overlords from the Lords of Dusk gets released, that could be the whole, you know, end game of your campaign. So there's a lot of really great stuff in here. So this is a fantastic book. I highly recommend that you check it out. And this is an important book as well from the perspective of Wizards of the Coast in the past had some trepidations about releasing campaign setting books uh, because by definition they do have a much more limited appeal than just standard supplements or, event or other books might have. So hopefully if this book is successful it will hopefully send the message to Wizards of the Coast that we want to see more of our favorite settings come back. So we want to see things like Dragonlance, like Greyhawk, like Mistara, like Planescape, like, um, um, well, Birthright's probably a stretch. But there's a lot of different worlds and settings that, you know, Wizards of the Coast could release that are classics that they haven't really touched on too much as of yet. But something like this, this book here, um, really gives, you know, hopefully um, the 
indication of what people are interested in. And if this book sells well, then I can see in another year or so something like Greyhawk or Dragonlance or even Mystara uh, coming out. So, um, I again, I can't recommend this book enough. I think that the Eberron setting is fantastic. I actually like the idea of magic being such a prevalent force in the world being used to create modern conveniences. I think that just is a stroke of genius, and I think it makes sense that, you know, if you have all these spellcasters with all these spells that they can use to create all these items, why wouldn't it be used to make life a little bit more convenient, right? So I, I like that aspect of, of the world, but the thing I really love about Eberron is the fact that it can be whatever you as the dungeon master want it to be. Uh, because there's enough building blocks there, but none of them are actually put into enough of a shape that you are forced to conform to what they have there. So you can be, you can do whatever you want with it. And I, again, I think that's the strength of this setting. So if you're on the fence about it, I do recommend checking it out, uh, picking it up. Um, because again, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. There's a lot of great adventure ideas. And again, the world really can be what you want it to be. So those are my thoughts on it. Um, I will do more comprehensive flip throughs of the different chapters in later videos as well. So if you wanted to see more of that stuff, it is coming, but I want to sort of get my thoughts, uh, out as much as I can here. So, uh, the, the basically, I, pretty much everything in this book, I think is really well done. The Warforged were a little bit disappointing to me. Uh, but I already have a solution for that, and other people may not be as bothered by it as I am. So, uh, awesome stuff overall. Very, very good campaign setting book. Uh, gives you just enough to work with while still allowing you to make it your own, and I can't drive that point home enough. Anyway, thank you guys very much for watching. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you've picked this book up. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, what are your thoughts on the Eberron setting? And if you've run campaigns in Eberron or if you played in campaigns, let me know what some of your experiences were. Did you play in a group that was trying to find out what caused the day of mourning? Did you spend a lot of time uh, searching through the, the ruins and the dungeons in Zendrick? Um, were you um, sort of uh, trying to fight back the insidious inspired conspiracy? Uh, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to know. Uh, anyway, thank you guys again for watching. Hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time. Take care.